Okay, here we are. Good morning, everybody. Um, what's up, Goldie here? And we're going to be going over the sort of getaway day slate uh, here on Wednesday, April 5th. Um, just a short nine gamer, a couple guys, a couple guys, a couple teams taking the day off, and we're still not getting the Reds. Um, I keep mentioning the Reds because there's some guys that I want to play <laughs> uh, in DFS. Uh, so they're still not on the main slate. They do this. Uh, they'll play a, an early 12:30 Eastern game uh, a lot on getaway days, Wednesdays, Thursdays. Um, so we might be missing them, similar to the Cubs, uh, a a good bit this season. Uh, today they actually play the Cubs, so um, there's that. In any case, we just have the the nine games to go over um and some really interesting decisions that we're gonna have to make i think uh mostly because we got a big time prospect on the mound for the orioles grayson rodriguez he is the stone min here at four thousand and in 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 the way of uh other starters on the mound, well, we got Cole, we got DeGrom, we got Cease, McClanahan, Burns, Javier, Luzardo, and Nola all up here. Um, <laughs> like, all of these guys are well-priced uh, in terms of, you know, where they will probably be later on in the season. For example, like yesterday, we saw Scherzer at 10-8, uh, and now we're getting Cole at 98. Now, things are always relative, um, slate to slate, so we can't just, like, strictly compare 10 8 well we paid 10 8 for scherzer yesterday um and that means that garrett cole is a thousand dollar better play or something like that it's not really how it works but um you know so we have to we have to consider prices within the context of each slate uh that said you know these are very workable price tags for um you know the the seven top guys or whatever that nine top guys really uh, that we mentioned here. Um, I mean, counting is hard. I guess it's eight. Uh, and you could really mix in any one of them with Grayson Rodriguez down here at the bottom of the list. He's very clearly going to lead the way in um, in the in the cheapy sort of point per dollar metrics and and sheet value scores. We do have the projections loaded. A little bit noisy here, still early in the morning, um, but we'll have these updated. Uh, as soon as, you know, most of the industry uh, wakes up, I suppose. Um, but that said, we do have the, the full nine games, and um, I think there's, you know, I've gone over the slate already, um, and I think there are so, some some spots that we can uncover and, and some value, uh, some attackable value. So while this may look like a really difficult day uh, on the surface, and undoubtedly it is, but it, I don't think it's any more difficult than any other slate, to be quite honest. But, um, you know, we've got some natural ownership uh, steam coming in so far on Garrett Cole, Jacob deGrom, of course, and Christian Javier in the very obvious spots. Um, but some of these other guys I think you might be able to get to as well. Uh, pretty much everybody in the lower mid-range here is going to be totally ignored, as I think they should be. But um, that said, we'll, we'll just get into the games here um, and and start off with uh, Philly and the Yankees. I uh, believe their final game of the series. It should be. It feels like they've been here for, you know, a month. Um, Aaron Nola, 7700 Good price for Nola here. Um, he got beat up a little bit against Texas in his first start. And I think Nola could very well be... Uh, a, a bounce target here um, that we could consider if you want to get off of some of the guys up top, get a little bit more contrarian with a, a cheaper SP1. Um, you know, Nola and, and Wheeler, of course, are kind of co-SP1s in Philly. And um, Nola it still has the 29% the K rate. So really what's interesting here when I was going over this, Nola and Garrett Cole are basically identical pitchers uh and that might sound a little bit shocking but frankly um i think nola is a little bit better than garrett cole the numbers are basically identical um in almost every metric including splits um 
but Garrett Cole gives up a little bit more power. He is more susceptible to getting on the barrel and giving up more hard contact than is Aaron Nola. So, um, you know, if I had to choose here today between the two, I would prefer getting to Nola. I think the strikeout matchups are just about the same in terms of Nola against the Yankees and, the, and Cole against the Phillies. Um, but Nola here is 2100 cheaper. So, you know, give me the discount on this guy every single time. Uh, Nola throws more strikes. He doesn't walk as many people, walks about half as many people. Um, the swinging strike rate, a little bit higher for Garrett Cole, of course. But Nola has better breaking stuff. Uh, his curveball has always been excellent. And in terms of raw value comparative to the league, um, it, it's basically on par with, with Garrett Cole's slider, which is a really good pitch for him. So uh, Cole does you know, mix in the curveball as well, so it gives him a little bit more versatility in that regard. But uh, both, or neither of them really have a very good changeup, and they don't throw the cutter all that often. It's just that Cole's arsenal, he relies on the four-seamer just because he has more velocity, um, and that allows him to increase the swinging strike rate, you know, a couple of ticks relative to Nola. But um, outside of those very small differences, the batted ball profiles are, are basically the same. Cole gives up more fly balls, but as we can see, you know, to righties, for example, uh, 231 average, 292 Woba, 171 ISO allowed to righties for Garrett Cole, and 236 average, 281 Woba, 143 ISO average allowed, 30% K rate, 29.2% K rate to righties. Um, you know, between both of these guys. So uh, the numbers across the board are, are pretty similar. Obviously, that's just the right-handed split that I went over, but um, that's not the only one, and pretty much everywhere. Uh, we're talking suppression metrics, whip, uh, strand rate, Cole's, you know, left on base rate is a, a little bit higher, uh, and that's because of the, the swinging strikes here. I think it's potentially a little bit noisy, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, Nola, if I had to choose between the two, give me Nola today and, instead of Garrett Cole. And certainly uh, at a third of the ownership, I think the 40 percent ownership on Garrett Cole is probably a bit too high. And this average projections, this median projection, at 25 points. Um, I, that seems quite aggressive uh, right out of the gate here. I think it's much more in line and reasonable to assume that uh, Aaron Nola could could push Garrett Cole and and challenge him um, to actually have a better start and a better outing today. So uh, we're really not worried about the strikeout matchup necessarily for either of them. I mean, certainly Philly is a little bit sticky at the top of the lineup. Trey only has about 18, 19% strikeout rate against righty, something like that. Schwarber will strike out, but he's got a, a ton of power, and that's really... Garrett Cole's significant weakness, it's to lefties, fly balls, and home runs, right? Um, similar to Scherzer, who we talked about yesterday, uh, when you're paying top-tier prices relative to everybody else on the slate for guys like this that have susceptibility, um, you assume a bit more risk. And when we pay cheaper prices, of course, some of that, that risk is mitigated. So uh, despite the sticky strikeout matchup i think it's fine for both of them it doesn't mean we just outright fade either cole or nola or both um but alec bohm doesn't strike out for example Derek hall kind of will but at 2600 a lot of that is is priced in because he's got raw power upside playing in yankee stadium in a day game against a guy that gives up homers right so um now yesterday the phillies rolled out their triple a lineup and uh it really like kind of made it bad just replacing one player, uh, Garrett Stubbs, um, for JT Real Muto. But this uh, they need Harper back, and they need him back in a hurry. They did win the game yesterday, so they looked a little bit better at the plate. Um, but they're still kind of struggling to, to get their legs under them here out of the gate today, uh, or early here in the season. Um, and today, um, I think... Playing Garrett Cole is perfectly warranted, but I'd definitely be worried here about this ownership. Like I said, if I had to choose between the two, give me Aaron Nola at a third of the ownership um, and basically identical numbers against, you know, a pretty similar lineup. I mean, DJ is not going to strike out. Judge will, Stanton will, 
Glaber is not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot, but um, he is definitely attackable as well. Josh Donaldson strikes out a crap load. So um, Aaron Hicks stinks if he's in this if he's in the lineup again, I don't even know why he's still on the major league roster. Um, he's been terrible for about three seasons now. IKF doesn't strike out, but everybody else is mostly pretty gettable. Um, and if you want to get a little bit contrarian here on the mound, I think getting to Aaron Nola is perfectly reasonable uh, off of Garrett Cole. So let's move on. Tampa and Washington. As we talked about yesterday, there was going to be offense in this game. And, and sure enough, uh, Tampa went to town. Washington went to town. Uh, off of Josh Fleming, and of course, Garrett, uh, Chad Cool was uh, predictably pretty bad. I think we can get to uh, some more offense uh, once again today, but definitely not from the national side. You got Shane McClanahan on the mound for the Rays, 8,800 for um, McClanahan, and an 18 point median projection so far. Similar ownership to what we saw in the last game with Aaron Nola. Uh, and I like this a lot. I would prefer saving a thousand to get off of Garrett Cole. Um, you know, we'll talk about Degrom here in a little while, but I, I think this is pretty valuable here. And the Nationals lineup um, against lefties in general is going to be a little bit sticky, right? Lane Thomas doesn't really strike out. Joey Manessa's sub 20% strikeout rate against lefties. Uh, Jamer, as the, even though he's terrible. Also doesn't strike out at a greater than 20% clip against left-handers. Um, Dom will strike out, however. He may not even be in the lineup over here. But Alex Call, a little bit sticky as well. Um, so that they may run this same list today against McClanahan. But they're going to have uh, markedly different results uh, compared to you know what they showed against... Um, Fleming yesterday so it like McClanahan is you know a, a top to your arm um and Josh Fleming's bullpen arm they can't strike anybody out right and on the contrary McClanahan's got a 30 percent K rate here with you know mid two ZRA with expected metrics uh in in the same range doesn't walk anybody doesn't beat himself and doesn't put people on base so stays off of the barrel here very little hard contact maybe a little elevated to lefties but like whatever i mean i'm not going out of my way to play a lefty against shane clanahan you kidding so strikeout numbers to both sides fantastic walk numbers to both sides fantastic ground ball numbers to both sides fantastic and this is everything we look for in a starting pitcher good price respectable ownership relative to everybody else on the slate and at least the other aces i think this is very playable today if you want to get to the rays and play some correlation pieces seems perfectly fine because they get patrick corbin on the other side who you know obviously just in one start he's not going to change his numbers from last season 201 iso allowed to to write he's 323 average with a 388 woba 18 percent k rate 40% hard contact rate with a 1.8 homers per nine. Just because he did get beat up by the Braves doesn't mean that uh, Patrick Corbin has you know, figured everything out here. Um, sinker's bad, four-seamer's bad, slider's bad, change is bad. Uh, just doesn't have it. He throws it over the plate, and he's pitching to a full 80% contact here. So um, on the barrel at a full 11%, it, it's actually not the highest number on the slate. We'll get to that in a second. Uh perhaps a bit surprising of a statistic. Um, but it, it definitely attackable. You can go right back to the Rays offense once again. And, you know, they're very versatile over here. They've got, uh, they'll probably sit Luke Rayleigh and play Harold Ramirez at first base, uh, even though Rayleigh has hit dingers in, in back-to-back days. Uh, but Yandy Diaz almost certainly going to lead off once again at 4,100. Um, he's perfectly fine and playable. And he doesn't strike out at all. He's got like a 6% K rate against lefties or something. So this is a pretty damn good play up here. Even though in terms of the raw power numbers, generally doesn't exhibit a, a whole hell of a lot of upside. Um, in this particular matchup, I think you can definitely get to that. Uh, Brandon Lau, I mean, he just, he looks terrible at the plate. Um, he looks very frustrated. So in, he's probably not going to play against a lefty anyway. They'll have Isak uh, Paredes back in the list who I really, really like. I forget the price tag off the top of my head, but uh, I think this is a very good matchup, batted ball-wise, for him today. Uh, you can get to him, certainly, and um, 
you know, do everything you can to not play Brandon Lau uh, anymore. He looks really bad at the plate. Randy Rosarena doesn't strike out, and at 5,200, uh, he's going to, you know, if he gets on base, he's going to try and steal bases too. Um, Wander Franco, a little bit of a slow start to the season, but don't worry about Franco. Uh, as I said again yesterday, price tag a little bit elevated for him in general. Uh, for the raw power upside that he brings to the plate, but um, he's got stolen base upside and a hell of a lot of contact upside as well. So uh, we'll have to see what they, they do behind the plate between Christian Bethencourt who caught yesterday. It'll probably be Frankie Mejia um, who hits from both sides. But that's, I mean, the, the Rays here are, are a very play, playable stack, a lot of multi-position eligibility and flexibility um, if you want to do a wraparound or something with Jose Siri, he's going to strike out a crap load, but uh, not necessarily against Patrick Corbin. He's got speed, and if he gets on base, he's going to steal as well. So they can really turn the lineup over here. Um, and as we saw yesterday, they've got pop. So uh, if you want to go after Corbin again, by all means, um, you can you can use the Rays for sure with some McClanahan. No Washington for me today. My, uh, Minnesota and Miami, they got uh, the Twins, that is. They got sort of Sandy Alcantara yesterday um, through a, you know, a complete game shutout uh, in like 100 pitches flat or whatever. So Sandy's just doing Sandy things. And the Twins with a former Marlin on the mound, Pablo Lopez, 7,400 today. Um, I think this is interesting for Pablo. He had a very good start uh, in his first outing. And I forget who it was against off the top of my head. In any case, doesn't really matter. He performed well. Um, but Pablo's problem has really always been two lefties. That's his, his main vulnerability. Um, 247 average allowed, 324 Woba with a 177 ISO. Just a 19% K rate against the lefties. Slightly elevated walk rate to them at 9% also. Uh, the hard contact number is, is still fine. So he doesn't get totally... You know, smashed by lefties because he induces a lot of soft contact. Full 21% here. It's a really good number, as a matter of fact. But that's still vulnerable uh, in terms of just raw power. His homer numbers are going to be suppressed because he pitched most of his games in Miami. So these, in uh, certainly a target field, um, now he's back in Miami today, of course, but certainly at, it, at target field going forward, uh, you probably see the homer numbers rise a little bit. At 12.5% uh, homer to fly ball rate, it is about average, um, but do not uh, be surprised if you see that increase a little bit uh, going forward. But overall, great numbers for Pablo. We like targeting him against very right-handed heavy lineups because he's got a 30% K rate to righties and a... a very solid ground ball to fly ball ratio to both sides of the plate, buck 40. And, you know, that slightly elevated barrel rate of about 9%, but nothing too terribly concerning. Um, you know, it has about four pitches here, but mostly relies on the four seamer and the change. Throwing the sinker cutter, just trying to mix in uh, some other garbage, uh, try and keep hitters off balance. And the curveball, he, he throws a little bit as well. So not too much in the in the in the ways of a, a breaking pitch arsenal um and mostly relies on the four seamer and the changeup and the changeup isn't really all that excellent only about uh what do we have here a seven eight mile an hour velo delta from the four seamer to the changeup so you'd want to see that closer to about 10 which is why he yields a little bit more power to the lefties so uh, i think he's a little bit attackable to be quite honest with some sneaky lefties here in in particular that's Luis rise 4,000. This guy's a damn good hitter, man. Like, there's a reason he's leading off, and, he, and a reason he led off for the Twins um, last all of last season. He hits lefties great, he hits righties great, and he's just a fantastic ball player. I really like playing him in general, and the upside leaves quite a bit on the table, but in terms of, um, you know, a cash play, like, you can play this guy damn near every single day. Jazz Chisholm, he's got fantastic numbers against righties as well. Uh, really good power numbers. We'll get the ball in the air. 5,600, a uh, little stiff, though, but, it, you know, it, in the events that he's only singling or walking and getting on base, he will steal also. Uh, unfortunately, the Marlins don't really have a ton much else to speak of in terms of lefties that we want to get after Pablo with. So if you want to run like a two-man or a three-man Marlins, I think that's okay. Throw in a, a Georgie Soler. He'll strike out a lot in this matchup, but 
plenty of power, 3,700, the, the price tag uh, is sort of accounting for a little bit of the strikeout downside there. Uh, same thing with Garrett Cooper, cheap, but, you know, is is going to strike out definitely. Uh, would probably st- stay off of Avisail Garcia, 3,400, there's just no upside for him. He just doesn't have any power anymore. Going back to his White Sox days, um, you know, when he, he did show a little bit of pop, but that has all since evaporated. Um, they may throw in a, a cheaper outfielder uh, like a Jesus Sanchez or something today. So keep an eye out for that if you do want to run a full lefty three-man uh, against uh, Pablo over here. Um, not too crazy about that. I don't think – I mean, there's plenty of other value, including just the, the guy on the mound that we'll get to in Grace and Rodriguez, uh, if you need to save a lot of money. So not sure that would be totally necessary. Would probably stay to the most – mostly the top half of the lineup over here for the Marlins. Um, on the mound for the Fish is uh, Jesus Luzardo once again. He getting his second start now. He went about five and two-thirds in his last start. Um, showed a lot of gas. He topped it 98, 99 even, and had really good strikeout stuff. Just kind of hit a wall in about the fifth, sixth inning. So, um, you know, something to be cognizant of in terms of stamina for some of these uh, younger pitchers having to work quicker with the pitch clock. Um, but excellent K numbers, great suppression numbers, really kind of broke out last season. And we're going to be looking forward to playing him pretty much, um, I mean, at every opportunity uh, this entire year. 7,900, this is another piece similar to Aaron Nola that you can play in this sort of upper 7K range. Um only showing about 8% ownership on him right now. I think the average, the median projection probably just about right as well. The Twins, in general, going to be a little bit sticky. Just a 22.5% K rate last season uh, against um, left-handers. But, you know, just an average creation rate, average ISO, average WOBA. So pretty much just average and they are missing of course uh, Luis Rise at the top of the lineup so that is going to increase the the strikeout rate pretty significantly um, of course they still have Byron Buxton who knows if he's even going to play I mean they're just DHing him uh, trying to keep him out of center field because the guy can't quit running into the damn wall um, they're trying to keep him healthy but they still just don't play him Unfortunately, he's got a huge, huge strikeout rate, and that probably contributes to that, of course. But, um, you know, we'd really like to play Buxton, but not at north of 6,000 if, um, you know, it, if the guy's not going to be on the field consistently. So who knows? They may have just given him a day off yesterday. Not really sure. But he'll almost certainly be back today. You can play Carlos Correa. He's got great numbers against lefties, but at 5,700, do we really want to attack Luzardo with that? Not sure. Josie Miranda, very attackable price here at 3,600. I think this is fine if you want to get off of a little bit of Luzardo, but I don't really see a reason to, to be quite honest. Um, nobody else that I really wanted to touch on here with the Twins. Uh, mostly the Marlins here in this game. I think there's some decent um, decent value in the betting markets as well. You can get them at evens, I think, right now, uh, which seems like a pretty good number to me. All right, Atlanta and Sam, uh, St. Louis, rather. Uh, Bryce Elder on the mound, 6,900 here for the Braves. Um, 20% K, 21% K rate. He's got a problem walking people, and I don't want to get into that kind of game with the Cardinals. Um, you know, they they were kind of stymied a little bit and stifled by um, Dylan Dodd yesterday, who came up and looked pretty good. Control was great. Uh, Bryce Elder doesn't have the same type of arsenal and the same type of stuff, however. Um, he did get a... a Decent look last season, um, nine starts and ten appearances, and the and the numbers were fine, relying mostly on the sinker slider combination, mixing the change up and a little bit of the poor seamer and cutter as well, but um, mostly just the two pitch guy. And I'm not sure I want to be attacking the Cardinals. I'm going to mention this pretty much every day. Don't want to be going after the Cardinals with right-handers much this season. They've got a lot of lefties here, and this is their right-handed lineup. Um, or, or their their lineup that they will go to against left-handers, rather, uh, leading off Tommy Edmond and and sitting like an Alec Burleson. Um, Large went on the DL. 
but they so they replaced that with uh, Juan Yepes, Taylor Motter types of guys. Um, the staples in the lineup are going to be Goldschmidt, Arenado, Contreras, Tyler O'Neill in there pretty much every day. So with the Jordan Walker, uh, who they will mix in against lefties, he'll probably platoon with. Um, one of these other guys, like a Dylan Carlson, for example, in the outfield, who will hit from both sides. Now, they're probably going to bring Brendan Donovan back up to the top of the lineup today, who sat yesterday, and he's had an excellent start to the season. I think you can play some lefties here with, like, an Alec Burleson in the two, in the two hole. You could probably play a Nolan Gorman. He'll, he might be a, a decent, cheap second base option for you against Elder um, today for the Cardinals as well. So... Plenty of ways to stack these guys. You could play Arenado again and Goldschmidt, for that matter, against pretty much everybody. Wilson Contreras, you want more so against lefties a little bit, but this is a playable catcher piece at 4400 for sure. Um, and good attainable price tags here for the Cardinals. A lot of upside with this, with this lineup. So I think you can get to them today for sure. On the other side, Miles My, Michaelis on the mound for the Birds. Uh, 7100 yeah, I, I don't really want to deal with this there's gonna be a lot of contact i think in this game uh elder just can't throw strikes right and he pitches to a lot of contact good spot for the cardinals and here on the other side michaelist 83 percent contact rate second highest number on the day 19 percent k rate so he's not going to walk people and he's just going to throw it over the plate and, and say good luck um so I d i'm not really sure that Targeting Miles Michaelis on the mound is going to provide a whole hell of a lot of value. Definitely against the Braves, or definitely not against the Braves, rather, because when we target the Braves, we need guys that can uh, really throw it by them because their main weakness is the swing and miss. 25% aggregate K rate last season against right-handers. They hit for some power, of course, 200 aggregate team ISO, 327 Woba, but, um, you know, a lot of hard contact, really, but... When they get to somebody that, that has some swing and miss in them, uh, they may struggle a little bit. Miles Michaelis is not that guy. So I think we can get to some Braves as well here. So nothing on the mound. Uh, if you want to play the Braves, um, get to pretty much both sides. Miles Michaelis, no real split to speak of uh, necessarily. And not like terribly attackable. So Braves are going to be off the board a little bit here today. And we do see in early ownership runs all about you know, six seven eight percent give or take same with the cardinals uh really nobody could be going to be playing offense in this game i uh, would prefer the cardinals if you do decide to go this route uh but that doesn't mean the braves are unplayable by any means you can play ronald cunha every single day he gets on he is going to steal or attempt to steal against literally every single uh battery in baseball um so a lot of upside here for Acuna still, and of course, plenty of power as well. Matt Olson, 5,000, a little stiff here for him. Austin Riley, 5,300, also a little stiff. Um, so the prices I'm not terribly crazy about. Michael Harris at 4,000 makes it a little bit easier to get to for sure. Travis Darno, another playable catcher piece, 4,000, had a very good start to the season so far. So um, in terms of raw values, not the best plays of the day, it looks like so far, but certainly playable. Um, and once again, with the with the projections, just kind of an idea and and some more so a guideline rather than a strict rule. Um, we want to take the this information into account for sure, but we don't necessarily want to let it dictate uh, all of our decision making in baseball because there's so much variance. So uh, perhaps mostly offense here in this game uh, and no pitching. Uh, Pittsburgh and Boston. Let's get to the final game in this series. Uh, interesting spot here. Um, Mitch Keller, you can't play him, number one, right? He still has trouble throwing strike one and, and walking people. He's got a, enough pitches that he's throwing, though, that it, it allows him to navigate and not get totally blown apart, despite a very high contact rate at 80% and just a 21% K rate. Um, once again, the, the suppression metrics, of course, and just the... the after the first start of the season, they're not going to move all that much. Uh, so everything else looks mostly average. Uh, and he's, he's just a typical sort of middle of the road, middle of the rotation type of starter uh, that is going to provide some value down here at these cheaper levels in good matchups. Today against Boston, probably not the best. 
Um, he'll spin it occasionally and really have his slider biting. And that will give him, um, you know, a standard deviation or two outsized performance to his uh, aggregate K rate. But um, most often, we're, we're mostly just going to be fading Keller. But that doesn't mean outright shorting Keller on the other side and getting to Boston. Can you play them? Yeah, of course. He pitches to a full 80% contact rate, so you can always play the team on the other side, hope that he walks people and pitches to a lot of contact because he could blow up and walk four or five guys and you're all of a sudden off to the races. Uh, Boston has had some good matchups in terms of their offense against the opposing pitching staffs early in the season. So I don't think they're quite this good. They did get a little stifled yesterday against Lorenzi Contreras, uh, a guy who's got reasonable stuff, lower strikeout rate himself, but uh, good stuff nonetheless. And same kind of goes for Mitch Keller. And at roughly the same price as Rowenzi yesterday, I I think we're kind of in the same boat here. Not super crazy about getting to Boston. They may be chalky, and we're we're seeing 10 to 12 percent ownership in aggregate on them as we come in today. They're probably going to be one of the more popular teams. Of course, you can always play Rafi Devers. You can play Verdugo. He's a little pricey at 45, to be quite honest. Not the best value play, but not terrible. Uh, Yoshida here at 4,700. Wish here a little bit cheaper. Uh, I think the price is a bit high. Tristan Costas, though, makes this playable at 2,900. He's getting a price bump now, so be mindful of that. Adam Duvall, he's going to strike out a crap load, not necessarily in this matchup, but uh, against right-handers in general. 3,900 probably also elevated for him. So not sure uh, I'm terribly wild about going after Mitch Keller here today. I generally don't like stacking against him. He just doesn't get torn apart all that regularly. So a huge ground ball rate makes that difficult. Um, so not not my favorite plays over here for Boston. Corey Kluber on the other side, throwing for the Red Sox on the mound. 7,000 for Kluber. Uh, I, I just don't think he can get to it. Um, against the Pirates, I respect this lineup up here, man. O'Neill Cruz is a good spot for him today. Brian Reynolds, once again, he's got fantastic numbers against righties, and he's really seeing the baseball. You can play him again, 5,200. I think this is perfectly fine. Carlos Santana's not going to strike out, going to walk a lot. Jimin Choi, probably not going to strike out a whole hell of a lot against righties either, and going to walk a lot as well. At 2,700, both of these guys, um, Carlos Santana at 3,900, a little bit more expensive, would rather play Jimin. Um, are playable in, in some Pittsburgh stacks if you want to attack Kluber again, who got kind of beat up pretty good in his first start as well. So uh, average projection here, median projection, I should say, at about 12, 13 points seems fine and really no ownership to speak of. Uh, I don't really want to go out of my way to be trying to get a, a whole hell of a lot of Corey Kluber. Um, play some lefties against him and, and really target. He, he's not going to walk people, so you might have struggle, uh, some struggles rather, in full stacking against him, but uh, look for a little bit of a bounce and Kluber to you know be serviceable, starting to get kind of into into the attractive price range here with with Kluber against generally what's going to be a uh, a subpar offense, but I think they are you know as I've mentioned here the early part of the the season here they're going to be markedly better than they have been in the past so. Um, I think O'Neill Cruz and Brian Reynolds are really good plays. You can m throw in the G-Man Choi, as I mentioned, at 2700 to make those guys a little bit cheaper. Uh, not going to see near as much ownership on them today as we have in the past, so or the last few days, rather. Um, so I don't really want any Kluber. Kind of off of Boston a little bit, to be honest. I don't like stacking against Keller. And give me a little bit of Pittsburgh. All right. Uh, Mets and the Brewers. Man, Scherzer got torched yesterday. We mentioned this. Like, he's got a homer problem. And, I mean, you can't really stack against Scherzer just because he has a homer problem because he doesn't give up homers all that often. Um, but it is an issue for him, and it is a, a significant weakness. You can't really expect him to give up three in an inning all too regularly, of course. But, um, you know, that's the risk that you assume when we pay 10-8 you know, for him. Uh and and we sort of overlook some of the other guys that uh, were just far better plays and, and better matchups um, than the Brewers. So today they uh, the Brewers get David Peterson on the mound at 7,200. 
he's got a problem throwing strikes, and it's strike one for him, which leads to a lot of walks. Now, he's got a full full four and call it four and a half pitches in the arsenal, which allows him to navigate this a little bit, and he doesn't pitch to a, a lot of contact. He's got a big strikeout rate, 27.5%, basically to both sides, 26 to righties, 32.5% to lefties. Uh, which keeps him out of trouble and really bails him out. But he has problems getting ahead of hitters. And if any of the breaking stuff is off, um, he's going to be very worrisome to, to sweat if you've got him on your team. So keep this in mind, even though it's an attractive price tag for him at 7200 uh, this is an attractive matchup in terms of raw strikeouts as well. The Brewers, 23.5% K rate. Uh, last season created however at a you know eight percent better than average clip 184 iso so they hit for some power 325 woba with a nine and a half percent walk rate so elevated there and some susceptibility for david peterson to put people on base and i don't really want to deal with that to be quite honest there's plenty of other arms that i'd rather get to rather just find the 500 play nola to be quite honest or 700 and play uh jesus luzardo Today, with David Peterson, I mean, he's still giving up, you know, power to lefties, so a, a bit of a reverse split, and you know, big ground ball to fly ball ratio, which is excellent against against righties at full two to one. But a lot of the Brewers are going to hit the ball in the air. That's Willie Adamas territory. Brian Anderson hit two yesterday. You could play him again. He's still cheap, three thousand. I think that's a a pretty good play. Uh, you're not playing $5,000 Christian Yelich against the... I don't, I don't know what we're doing over here at DraftKings, but um, you're not playing Wink either. But you can play some of the righties, like a Luke Voigt. You want to throw him in instead of a Rowdy Telez at first base. I think that's probably playable as well uh, if you want to attack David Peterson. Now, be aware that they are going to strike out. All of these guys do. So there is deep tournament upside at very low ownership for David Peterson. Um but significant risk because he walks so many people. Corbin Burns on the other side, 8600 really good price for Burns. Maybe a little sneaky. I don't want to say sneaky. We don't like attacking the Mets in general, but um, you know, Corbin Burns, a little bit susceptible here. Like He'll give up a, a bit of power sometimes, and I, you know, I really like the stuff, of course. The cutter is a very good pitch for him, but the changeup's not great. And it makes him a little bit susceptible to to left-handers, but really nothing crazy. Most of these numbers are fantastic for Burns. He's got a 30% K rate. Suppression metrics are great. Sub buck, sub 1-0 whip. It is strike one though that is a little bit of a concern for him. At just 58%. He's got enough chase in him that he can, you know, bury the curveball, bury the slider, and really run the cutter in on the hands to right-handers and away from lefties so that that sort of buoys the swinging strike rate keeps him out of trouble deeper in the count but that doesn't mean that uh he is not susceptible at all to a little bit of hard contact he will pipe the fastball or the cutter i should say uh on occasion two right handers and that will get him dinged up a little bit but uh he didn't have his best stuff in the first outing got beat up i forget who it was but gave up like four runs in his first start. 8,600 is a perfectly playable price tag. Uh, 19, 20, per, or 20 points uh, for a median projection in the early going here against the Mets. I don't know. Seems a little high, to be quite honest. Uh, I think I would rather get to a couple of cheaper guys, but or maybe even a more expensive guy. Um, at 13.5% ownership, as we're, we're showing on him right now, uh, he's going to be kind of ignored, which makes him a good tournament play. And anybody with a 30% K rate and good suppression metrics who is probably going to be able to go deep into a game in general, it, they're, they're solid tournament targets. However, the Mets aren't going to strike out. So this is going to be a difficult matchup for him in that regard, even though he has you know really big K numbers. Uh, Nimmo, Marte, Lindor, Pete Alonso, none of these guys K. Jeff McNeil doesn't strike out. Like... Very difficult list to get through, um, you know, over here through the Mets. So difficult to navigate, I think. Uh, Corbin Burns probably going to not make the cut today uh, for me personally. I think I'd rather get to some other guys. But I think you can play 
you know, maybe a couple of the, the Brewers righties here if you want to take some shots against David Peterson. Um, if you want to stack the Mets because they don't strike out, go ahead. Nobody is going to be on this team. Um, and they have upside because they've got a lot of power. This game is in Milwaukee. Ballpark will play up some power a little bit. But uh, you really want to be paying 48 for Nimmo, 54 for Starling Marte, and 54 for a really cold Frankie Lindor out of the gate, 58 for Alonzo? Uh, not me. No thanks. All right, Baltimore and Texas. Um, here's Grayson Rodriguez, 4,000 on the mound. This is, this is really kind of the um, the – rookie elephant in the room if you will he's making his debut he's got five pitches and good velocity he struggled a little bit in the spring however uh which is why he didn't make the opening roster and the opening rotation but uh of course we don't have any data here in the sheet but this is the top pitching prospect outside of i guess dl hall for the orioles um in terms of you know starting rotation got kind of guys here so at 4,000 with a median projection so far of about 11 points uh, I think this seems fine perhaps a bit low and really I don't like attacking Texas we could be attacking Texas uh, they've been pretty bad here in the opening uh, week of the season in terms of just DFS scores of course uh, Corey Seager 4,700 you can play him against Everywhere you can play him against lefties too, sure. Uh, Nate Lowe, he got into a ball yesterday, 4,200, still playable price here. 4,600 for Adolis Garcia, also playable. Uh, you want to play Robbie Grossman? I think this is a very interesting, cheap piece if you need to get up to two expensive pitchers today. Uh, Robbie Grossman could be a nice value play for you here, hitting in the six from both sides of the plate at 2,800 for the Rangers. Um, so I think they're they're playable. Not my favorite. I think I'd rather just side with the stone minimum uh, starting pitcher here who is stretched out. He did only go, I believe, four in his first outing in the minors this season, but he is a starter. So we, we don't really have that to worry about. Might only go five innings. Uh, if he's going well, you might squeeze six out of him. But really, you only need five innings uh, out of a guy that's a stone minimum price. So he will make... He will unlock pretty much everything for you on the mound and in the batter's box uh, all day today. So pretty much everywhere, there's, he makes the expensive stacks gettable. He makes the expensive uh, secondary pitchers uh, or primary pitchers, I suppose, uh, gettable as well. If you want to play both he and DeGrom on the other side, I think that's fine. You know, you're only paying 13 5 for, for two starting pitchers here. Um, one of them being DeGrom with a 42.5% strikeout rate. I mean, sounds pretty damn good to me. So he's going to unlock pretty much everything. But like I said, five pitches here, and I'm not sure I want to really attack with Texas. I think I'd rather side with him and just assume the risk because most of it's priced in with the lack of a price tag, so to speak. So uh, give me, yeah, definitely give me some Rodriguez. He's going to unlock everything for us. 9,500 for DeGrom. Uh, 23 point projection here seems fine uh, against the Orioles. I really don't want to target them, but 43% K rate. I don't really care. Uh, Degrom got blown up in his last start and only threw, I don't know, 65, 70 pitch, something like. I forget the exact number, but um, yeah, this is Degrom. Okay, 43% strikeout rate over a respectable sample. Uh, it, you cannot ignore this, and I don't really care what team he gets, uh, including a team I respect in the in Baltimore, did, like, we're playing him anyway. So at 9,500, of course, he's going to see the elevated ownership here at 30%. think it's fine. Should he be in one of every three teams or one of every six, I, I, I suppose, if you want to look at it that way? Um, uh, yeah, definitely. So probably a bit low in, in the ownership, I think. I, I would definitely prefer him to Garrett Cole today. I And like I said, I prefer Aaron Nola to Garrett Cole. Um, so there's a few guys that I would rather play than Cole at the top. DeGrom's certainly one of them here. But he is susceptible to hard contact to righties and some power. 154 ISO to lefties, 205 ISO to righties, despite the you know mega strikeout stuff north of 40% to both sides. Doesn't walk anybody. But, um, you know, we'll pipe it occasionally because he is only throwing the four-seamer and the slider most often. Does has to have the change in the curveball. There's just kind of a show-me change and a show-me curveball. Um, 
but he throws strikes, and he throws a lot of them. So get whatever DeGrom that you can find. Uh, I think he's perfectly respectable today. If you want to take shots, I mean, no thanks. I think it's a pretty poor and low probability play stacking the the Orioles on the other side against DeGrom. I just don't think you need to do it. There's plenty of other attackable arms, and they're expensive um, given who they're facing. So no thank you. Just give me DeGrom and some Rodriguez, maybe a little bit of Texas just to – if you know, come off some of the uh, the 4K cheap pitcher here because there's variance with a rookie. Okay, Detroit and Houston. Um, Eddie Rodriguez on the mound for the Tigers. We're not touching him against Houston. Um, if you want to get to an expensive stack today, I think Houston qualifies uh, as opposed to like a Boston or something like that. Um, they're not going to be nearly as popular, so you can you could pivot to a, a Houston Astros. Think this is fine because Eddie has a 19% K rate and 84% contact rate. It's a huge number against a reasonable sample here, or in a reasonable sample, I should say. Uh, 79 and a third against righties last year. 293 WOBA allowed, fine. 145 ISO also fine, but just at 18.5% K rate. 20. 7% hard contact rate, so, you know, not terribly attackable here, but there's too much contact. Um, it, it's not hard contact, which is good. It is to the left side, probably a noisy sample here in just 17 innings so far, but uh, if he's going to be flat in the strike zone with a lack of a breaking pitch, and he's mostly a four-seamer cutter sinker guy, he's just throwing fastballs for the most part, which is why he's exhibiting a, a bit of a reverse split here. So far in this in this tiny sample, 206 ISO to lefties with a 40% hard contact rate uh, and 1.6 homers per nine to the left side. So if you want to play Jordan, go ahead. Like you got free reign. 6,000 is a little stiff for him um, in general, but once again, he's you know he you could play him every single day. He's up in the uh, Jose Ramirez, Mike Trout, Choi Otani, uh, Ronald Acuna zone. Uh, you play him every single day. He's one of the best hitters in the league. So don't worry about the split. Uh, Jeremy Pena, Alex Bregman, 5,100, 5,200, respectively. Uh, you can play them as well. They're expensive, like I said, but 4,400, Josie Abreu makes this a little bit more palatable. If you want to mix in some Kyle Tucker, nobody's going to be playing him. Um, nobody really – I mean, perhaps they will. We're actually showing 12% ownership on him. It's kind of surprising. Um, may have to check these numbers. may not be totally accurate, but uh, Corey Jolks, once again, a, a prospect getting a good bit of playing time for the Strohs uh, in the early going here while Michael Brantley's on the shelf. 2,300 makes these guys playable and attackable. Stay off of the Martin Maldonado, Jake Myers types of guys. Um, play some David Hensley at second base if you want to do that. Uh, need, you know, some more some cheaper pieces to get to the Jordan, Bregman, Pena uh, guys who you do want to play. Um, on the other side, for the Astros on the mound, Christian Javier in his second start, 8,100, still cheap. And uh, he's going to be mega chalk again, 36% ownership as of right now. Looking fine. Projection probably as a median a little bit high, but... I, I don't particularly care. Uh, the matchup is too good here for the Tigers, uh, or against the Tigers, rather. They're going to strike out markedly more than they do against lefties, but they're still not going to create. Just a 74 WRC plus last season, buck 13 ISO, and a 270 WOVA in aggregate against righties for Detroit. So they're they're bad. They're going to be bad. Um, really, the they don't have any excellent hitters over here, to be quite honest. Uh, Torque got into a ball yesterday. Uh, off of Ryan Stanek. He hit a ball so hard and so far, it was kind of shocking. Um, so if, if he, he looked really good yesterday, Torkelson, so uh, at the plate. If he can, you know, this is really what they've been expecting, the Tigers. If he can cut down on the swing and miss, it's going to be very attractive to play him at super cheap price tags, 2100 Fly ball pitcher is Christian Javier at in 040. That is a big ground ball to fly ball ratio, or big fly ball to ground ball ratio, I suppose. And will give up some hard contact, 34% nearly, to right-handers, and a little bit in the power department, buck 45 ISO. The problem that you're going to run into with playing a guy like Torque or a Javi Baez, Eric Haas, anything like that, any of the righties from Detroit, is Javier's got a 40% strikeout rate to the right side. So you don't really want to deal with that. Um, 
8,100, I think, is a perfectly playable price tag for him. Four-seamer slider mix, show me curveball, show me change. And that's really what gives him the, the heavy, heavy fly ball lean. So much four-seamer and so much slider. Uh, but he's off the barrel, and he's got a little bit of an issue throwing strike one. But the strikeout stuff and the swing and miss, the chase is good enough uh, to keep him really out of trouble. So, uh, once again, this is... Detroit, you can go after them once again, even though they put up a couple on Framber yesterday. He was still fine and and put up, I don't know, 27 or something like that. So uh, that's most often what we're going to see starting pitchers with strikeout stuff do against a Tiger. So uh, full correlations with Houston today. You could play expensive stacks. Not really going to be played in terms of the offense. So um, if you want to come, you know, reduce your exposure to... Or, or at least differentiate your exposure, I, I suppose, um, on Christian Javier with some Astro stacks, by all means. Uh, I'm on board with that. Okay, uh, last game of the day here. San Francisco into White Sox. Logan Webb, he was good against the Yankees in his first start. Uh, struck out eight, I think, in six innings. Pretty respectable. Kind of outsized to his um, aggregate numbers here. It's just a 21.5% K rate. But he will pop occasionally, and he'll occasionally have the, the slider and the changeup going all with the sinker with a huge ground ball to fly ball ratio at, at 235 nearly. Um, he stays off the barrel, doesn't give up a whole lot of hard contact really to either side of the plate, and a very low line drive rate. So stays out of trouble, does Logan, and occasionally he's going to pop for 8Ks. Sometimes uh, against the White Sox, really, I'm not going to target that. I think the Yankees are probably going to have a little bit more swing and miss in them than will a team like the White Sox. They're probably going to be pretty sticky once again this season. Um, as of, well, from yesterday, I didn't have a lineup for them. So at least here in the sheet, uh, you can target a couple of the the White Sox. And really not my favorite plays, to be honest. Like Tim Anderson's still pretty expensive. Uh, we'll get to some of these guys here as we have our lineups are already kind of rolling in. Um, Andrew Benintendi really doesn't have a whole lot of upside from the left side. Uh, 3,700. Uh, Yohan Moncada is 44. He's still a playable piece here if you want to get to that. Oscar Colas is cheap. Um, if you want to one-off somebody, not my favorite, though, down here at the bottom of the lineup, even at 2,600. So overall pretty expensive here for the White Sox. Don't really want to deal with a Lloyd 48 or anything like that. Uh, 54 for Tim Anderson. No, thanks. So... Probably mostly fading the White Sox here. Doesn't mean I really want to play Logan Webb. Concerned about the upside in tournaments for him just because of the low strikeout rate, but the suppression numbers are excellent. On the other side, Dylan Cease on the mound for the Sox. Uh, 9,100 for Cease. He's another one of these guys in, in sort of the mid-range, cheaper than both Cole and DeGrom that is going to see markedly lower ownership. Half of the ownership that we're seeing on both of those guys coming to Dylan Cease right now at a 20-point median projection. Seems pretty reasonable to me. The Giants struck out at a 24% clip and were basically just average in every other batted ball metric against right-handers last season. And Dylan Cease is, well, he's an above-average right-hander. He's got a 31% K rate. Really, the only problem with Cease is the walk rate, and it's throwing strike one. He does have the four-seamer slider, which gives him, the once again, the, the slight fly ball lean. Um, really no off-speed pitch that will allow him to um, you know, mix up the arsenal a bit more and, and drop the walk rate and get some more swing and miss. Not that he necessarily needs it, but I'd really like it if he could uh, introduce a really good third pitch, probably in, introduce a cutter maybe, and really kind of get in on, on on the hands to right-handers. Not that he has a problem with it, but this could really improve his arsenal. Um, maybe give him a little bit more chase if he developed a splitter a little bit more. No, but he doesn't throw it a lot right now. So um, his strand rate, markedly high and kind of, kind of concerningly high, 82%. I don't think this is sustainable long-term. So if you're going to see some regression with Cease, uh, he does walk people and he does put them on base and... If that strand rate comes down, well, it's going to be in the way of you know guys driving in runs. So uh, there's a little bit of concern there, but he's not on the barrel, and he's got a huge strikeout rate. So he's throwing it by people, 15% swing strike rate. 
low called strike rate. And this is why I mentioned that he needs a good third pitch to really punch him into the 33, 34% CSW rate range. And that would make him one of the top end starters in, in baseball. I don't think he's quite there yet. He's probably a top 10 to 12 starter, I would say. Uh, but the addition of a third really good pitch uh, would kind of push him over that plateau. So do we want to target him with the Giants? No, not really. Um, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. The Giants hit a lot of fly balls with all these lefties over here. So uh, not really the best batted ball matchup, and he's not going to give up a lot of power. We'll see. So um, no thank you on a lot of the Giants. Um especially if we've got weather concerns there today. I don't really want to deal with that. But you could play some Cs in tournaments on the mound for sure. Like I said, decent value uh, in the ownership department for sure. And in the projection, I think it, it looks pretty okay as well. So if you want to get off of some of the, the upper tier guys, um, I think Cs is a pretty good option. So that's it for the breakdown. Um, in terms of the games, let's go over stacks real quick. Uh, I don't really want to, I'm not stacking against really either of these guys in Yankee Stadium. Give me Nola over Cole, uh, even though you could play both of them for sure. Give me McClanahan and the Rays against Patrick Corbin, definitely. Uh, I don't want anything to do with Washington today. Minnesota and Miami, I like the Marlins a little bit here, but just probably in short stacks against Pablo. Pablo's elite against the right side, so I don't want to deal with that. I like Jesus Luzardo as well. I think there's a good bit of uh, untapped upside that we're we can see with the lizard uh, on the mound here for the Marlins no twins really if you want to get to like a Josie Aranda um, uh, or, or something I what no I called him by the wrong name um, Jose Miranda I said Aranda I don't know why I did that but uh, Jose Miranda against uh, Jesus Luzardo I think that's okay he's in the middle of the lineup and he's cheap um, Atlanta and St. Louis here, uh, no, no pitching for me, too much contact, uh, sneaky offense. Not a lot of guys could be playing this game. So, um, you can play this for sure. Pittsburgh and Boston. I'm off of Boston a little bit. I just don't like attacking Mitch Keller. It's probably going to bite me, um, today, but I would prefer Pittsburgh once again, not so much on the mound, but attacking Kluber, I think is warranted. Uh, give me a little bit of the Mets and some some very, very deep tournament sneaky stacks, uh, short stacks. I, I think Corbin Burns might be a little susceptible um, to a team that is going to make it difficult on him. And he can get, you know, he can give up three runs or something, four runs, and uh, that totally nukes his day. So I'm kind of off of Corbin Burns. Give me the other guys. No David Peterson. Give me some Brewers. Um, if you want to play a deep tournament, David Peterson at very low ownership, he's got the strikeout stuff and the Brewers will, will whiff. So, uh, that's, you know, a playable piece for you as well, but mostly we're just going to be getting to a lot of, uh, DeGrom and Grayson Rodriguez today with some Christian Javier, Dylan Cease, like we mentioned, uh, Aaron Nola, McClanahan, um, for Baltimore, don't I'm not targeting DeGrom, go nuts if you want to, but, uh, no thanks. And... Texas, if you want to play some some Texas stacks against a, a rookie arm making his debut, uh, I, I probably won't argue with you, but I'd, pr I'd side with uh, Rodriguez here. Got a, enough in the arsenal to make it playable. Detroit and Houston, nothing for the Tigers, um, including Erod. Give me all of Houston and Christian Javier on the mound. San Francisco and the White Sox we just talked about. Uh, no Giants for me today, and really probably no White Sox, mostly pitching in this game. I think you could play in cash maybe a Logan Webb if you want to. Concerned about upside for tournaments. So that's really where we stand so far uh, with the with the breakdowns, guys. Um, projections are up, but as lineups start rolling in and the models adjust across the industry, we'll have updates as well. So don't forget about the early start. Uh, starting here in about, uh, I don't know, four hours, give or take. Um, but get different on the mound here today. I think you can, you don't have to eat this chalk up here, up top. There's some playable pieces down in the mid-range. Uh, probably not so much in the lower mid-range, as we talked about. But um, you can get different and embrace that variance like we talked about yesterday. All right, good luck.